Thank you, Slush, for having us. We are delighted to be here. I'm Zephy, this is Vicky. We're two of the people who work at Sequoia on Arc, our company building immersion for seed stage founders and pre-seed stage founders. Before we start, I just want to say thank you. It really is a privilege for us to spend time with founders. We know how busy all of you are, and thank you for spending the next 30 minutes with us as we talk through product market fit. My colleague Vicky is a product partner at Sequoia. What does that mean? She runs our product org where we build tools for the founders and investors in our team. Alongside that, she's worked in product for the last 15 years, working with companies pre-product market fit, post-product market fit, and before Sequoia running mobile monetization at Instagram. She has a real deep expertise and insights on the topic, and I'm delighted that she's with us today. Hey, everyone. And I would love to introduce my colleague, Zephy Hennessy Holland. He's the senior director of the ARC program at Sequoia. He's my partner in crime. And he's worked with hundreds of founders at the earliest of stages over the past decade, helping them navigate their journeys to product market fit. Importantly, he's been a founder himself. So he's been in your shoes, experiencing his own journey to finding product market fit. He's also got a great accent and a deep, booming voice that's a joy to listen to. So I'm sure you'll enjoy the next half hour with him. Thank you, Vicky. One of the things that we believe very deeply at Sequoia is that finding product market fit earns you the right to build the company. And so at this early stage, really, it should be your sole focus. What do we mean by that? Before product market fit, everything is about customers and product. And after product market fit is when you have the opportunity to think about what is the organization I want to build? What's the scale of which I want to do this? How do I build the system that will continue to build products over time? As a founder, there are so many different pulls on your time. We know that. There are amazing conferences like this. There are wonderful investors you want to spend time with. You want to figure out what the right name for your startup is. And all of these things are very important. There's no doubt there. But finding product market fit is both urgent and important. And unless you get there, none of those other pieces matter. So every single thing that hopefully as founders you're focused on at the moment should be in service of that. What do we mean when we say product market fit? I know that as a founder, this was something I probably screamed at my co-founder many, many times as we tried to figure this out. It is a terrifying question for early stage founders. How do I know if I'm there? How do I know how to get there? And there's been a lot written on the topic. And regardless of the content or the origins or who's writing it, the, the content seems to have one common theme. So there's everything from it's when the ball, instead of being pushed up the hill, starts to go down the hill to the superhuman 40% very disappointed score, all the way through to the most helpful, you know it when you'll see it. Now, ultimately, each of these different pieces of feedback is true, but what we've heard from founders is they're not as helpful as they could be. And the reason why is because they focus on the outputs. And as founders, what you really focus on is the inputs. What are the things that you need to do each day to make progress on your journey to product market fit? And so we want to cover today two frameworks that will hopefully mean that after Slush, when you go back and leave Helsinki and are back to your teams, you have more clarity on how you can make changes to give you an extra advantage in finding product market fit. So this first framework, it flips product market fit on its head. What do I mean by that? We well, hear in the phrase itself, product market fit. Product comes first. Product always comes first. Product is often talked about as if it's in a vacuum. Your product needs to acquire customers, your product needs to engage, your product needs to retain. You, as founders, are probably obsessed with your product, and rightfully so. What would it look like to be equally as, or even more, obsessed with your market? What if within that market, the customer's mindset on the problem that you're solving is actually the key to unlocking it all? From that customer mindset actually comes the market landscape that you're entering. From that customer mindset comes all the hurdles that you're going to have to overcome. And only when you understand those dynamics deeply will you be able to bring your unique insight to meet the market. Will you be able to turn that unique insight into an actually differentiated value prop in a product? And will that product actually change customer behavior? Because at the end of the day, product market fit is just some fancy industry term for saying that the customer's behavior changed after it intersected with your product. And the customer mindset is the anchor for it all. OK, so now you're probably thinking, customer mindset, great. There's got to be a million of those, right? How are you going to help me address my customer and my market? Luckily, we at Sequoia have partnered with thousands of companies over the past 50 plus years. And so when we took a look back at all the companies that we partnered with, we actually saw just three customer mindset archetypes emerge. The first, we call hair on fire. 
And I love this name the most because it most viscerally describes the mindset of this customer. They need your help now. They needed it yesterday. They've been out there looking for a solution to this problem that obviously matters a ton to them. They're leaning in, they're pounding the table for their life to be better from this problem. In contrast, you have the hard fact customer. And if the hair on fire customer was leaning in, the hard fact customer is leaning back in their chair, they're crossing their arms, they're shrugging their shoulders, and they're saying, it is what it is. They just don't actually see a path to this problem being any better than it is today. And then finally, you've got the future vision customer. And if I could have put an emoji up here on the slide, it would have been the asleep emoji because this customer isn't thinking about you. They're not thinking about your product. And they're not even thinking about the problem that you're solving. And if you told them about it, they would say, yeah, right. I'll believe it when I see it. It's been amazing to see the reception of this framework since we released it publicly earlier this year. We now have founders applying to Arc saying, hey, I'm solving a really hair on fire problem. Or now that I realize that this was a hard fact problem, it completely changed the way that I deal with my customer and my market. I'm curious, we've only given a very brief preview, but does anyone here feel like they're on the hair on fire path with their customer? Yeah, a couple out here, okay. Any hard fact resonate with you? Okay, a lot more hands. Any future vision founders here? Yeah, okay, proud ones, awesome. So this is exactly what we want to see. We want you to take this framework, see yourself in it, and make it your own. So hopefully you'll be able to do that today. Let's jump into more detail. Okay, so we're gonna go through each of the different archetypes. And first off, we're gonna cover the market characteristics that exist, and then what the characteristics of the products that have met those markets that we've seen be most successful. So how to know if you're in a hair on fire market? Well, your customers will tell you. The clue is in the name. There is no uncertainty about whether or not the problem exists. The only uncertainty is which solution are they gonna work with? So if you're going to customers and they're already live with either your competitors, those could be incumbents, they could be startups, then you're probably in a hair on fire market. There's a real pain. Now, the good thing about that is that you know that you're building something people want, right? And that's so much that's hard about building startups and so much conventional advice says build something people want. The downside of working in a hair on fire market is how competitive it is. And one of the things that is a privilege about working at a place like Sequoia is that we get to meet many brilliant founders. And over the last two years, I would say the category in which we've met probably more founders than most is the AI sales tech market, the AI SDR market. And I'm sure there are many founders in this room who've worked on or are working on businesses in that space. And there is clear market demand. The issue is we've met over 70 companies in that space. That is a large amount of customers. That is a large amount of competitors to try and fight for that same customer. So in order to overcome and figure out how to break through, it's about how do you rise above the noise in this market? How do you figure out how to be different, not merely better? That's what the most compelling companies have managed to do. One litmus test that we use at Sequoia and during Arc with founders is asking the question, if you go to a potential customer of yours who's already live with a competitor, and demo your product, is it compelling enough for them to break their existing contract and move to you? Because that's what a compelling value proposition looks like in a hair on fire market. A compelling value prop is one part of the equation, but it's not everything. Because these markets are competitive, speed is incredibly important. The more competitive a market is, the faster founders need to move in order to capitalize on the opportunity. And we talk about this idea of velocity which is the combination of speed and direction. And so the companies that manage to rise above the noise and win in hair on fire markets combine a compelling value prop with velocity. Let's go into an example. So let's take a look at Wiz. Wiz is a portfolio company of ours that has managed to do something truly fantastic, which is navigate a hair on fire market and set the record for the fastest growing SaaS company of all time. The Wiz founders were repeat founders. They understand the value of a good idea. So when they were starting their next company, they knew they wanted to take the time, speak to customers, and understand where should they go. And their background was in cloud infrastructure security. So that was where there was curiosity. And they spent time speaking to customers, and it took some digging, but eventually they found an insight that was different, and they had a novel and compelling solution because of their technical background that would blow customers away. This was already a crowded market. You had companies like Palo Alto Networks and Orca Security who already had live products out there. But Wiz managed to figure out how to stand out. They built a product which for their customers 
it didn't require them to install what's called software agents on their servers in order to find and flag vulnerabilities. What that meant was that in a 15-minute demo, they could immediately show value in a ways in which the incumbents they were looking to disrupt just couldn't compete on. And so they combined this compelling value prop with a massively aggressive approach, and they went hard at the market. During the day in Israel, they would be, the engineers would be writing code, building the product that needed to be in the hands of users. And the moment 5 o'clock happened, they would get on the phone speaking to customers in the US doing sales. And it was this combination of a compelling value prop and a, and a differentiated and aggressive go-to-market strategy that meant that they broke out. And they managed to go from 0 to 2.8 million of ARR in one quarter and 0 to 100 million of ARR over the first 18 months of the business. So in contrast to the hair on fire customer, you have the hard fat customer. And they are tired. They are resigned to live with whatever it is that they have to the solution to this problem today. And that solution, it's probably decades old software. It's some sort of duct tape together, patchwork of things that they've cobbled together over the years. And they are resigned to live with this. And so the thing that you have to overcome with this customer is habit. And it's their skepticism that it could be any better. And now this may sound better than elbowing your 70 closest competitors on the hair on fire path, but we're all human. You're human, I'm human. We all know how difficult it is to change our habits. And we all know how difficult it is to actually overcome something you're skeptical of. That's what you've got to do if you're a founder on this path. So your product has to be novel enough, has to be compelling enough to shake this customer awake. You've got to elicit a customer epiphany. And I know that's a ridiculous word, a ridiculous hyperbolic word, but I'm using it very intentionally here. I want you to imagine you're reaching your hands across the table to this customer's shrugging, crossed arm shoulders and saying, no, it can be better than this. That's the job for your product to do. It's got to be that compelling. Because you're convincing this customer not just that your product is interesting, but that this problem can be solved in the first place. Because that's not what they believe today. And so the failure mode on this path, obviously, is having a product that's not compelling enough to do that. But there's another actually somewhat surprising failure mode on this path. And that's actually picking a fact that's not even a hard fact. What do I mean by that? If you were to revolutionize the solution to this problem, the customer's response would be, yeah, I actually don't really care enough to change my habit here. And you'd be surprised how many businesses actually end up in this failure mode on this path. So then, of course, the winning ingredients here are pick a problem that people actually care enough about to break their habit, and then put something in front of them that is so compelling that they actually are convinced that this problem could be solved in a different and much better way. So one example I'd like to go through here that's near and dear to my heart as a product person, and near and dear to this country, given the founders are Finnish, is Linear. Linear is issue tracking software for product development teams. And I've been in product management for about 15 years. I think I've earned the right to say that issue tracking tools suck. They suck as a product manager. I think so too. They're overweight. They're complicated. They're always in your way. And somehow they're never actually updated. I don't know how that's possible. And Linear could have taken this as just a hard fact of life and moved on to solve a different problem. But instead, they said, no, I want to build this from the ground up, specifically for the individual contributor engineer. The IC engineer, not the PM like me, not the engineering manager, not the leadership team. For the people that are actually picking up tasks day in and day out and moving the ball forward. And with this customer in mind, they built a product that's simple. It's modern. It's opinionated. So it stays out of your way. And engineers love it. We use Linear in my engineering team. And so I saw this epiphany with my own two eyes. About a year into us using Linear, our IT team came to us and said, hey, guys, we have too many issue tracking tools out here. we got to consolidate over onto this one. And my engine team was up in arms. They wrote a multi-page, single-spaced manifesto about all the different reasons that they wanted to keep Linear. Some of them even offered to pay for their Linear seats out of their pockets. So that's what it looks like to switch this customer, to shake this customer awake. They go from being a skeptic to being an evangelist for you. That's what you want to see on the hard fact path. Now, on to future vision companies. And I saw that there are a few sheepish hands in the air because future vision companies, these are the big scary ones. These are the ones that often end up leaving the biggest dent in the universe. But they're tricky beasts. Future vision companies have the most paths to failure, the fewest paths to success, but when they work, they can have a huge amount of impact. 
These are companies that exist on the spectrum between impossibility and novelty. Now, let's take an example. Let's look at SpaceX, reusable rockets. What's the customer response to that? Yeah, right, that's not possible, you can't do that. What's the, what about the iPhone in 2007? That was one where people didn't know that they needed it until they saw it. And so if you had to pitch them on this device, they would have said, yeah, right, why do I care? Why does that matter? So if you're building a company in this path, it's about overcoming this incredible disbelief that people have that either if the, your thing matters or that your thing is even possible in the first place. The upside of that disbelief is usually for companies in this path, the market is wide open. There's very few competitors. So if you're successful, you end up being able to have incredible pricing power and very durable businesses. But in order to overcome this disbelief, there's a couple of things you need to do. The first is to paint the long-term vision about why your customers' lives will be different if you are right. So for SpaceX, it's not just about reusable rockets. It's about reusable rockets as an enabling technology such that humanity can become an interplanetary species. Can you think of a more broader vision that is going to motivate talent, investors, customers than something like that? It's a treacherous path, though. And so as a founder in this path, the thing to figure out is what are the commercial stepping stones you can take along the way? When SpaceX got started, they weren't saying, hey, we're going to be the, uh, we're going to be the you know, interplanetary taxi for everyone. They were saying, we're going to be reusable rockets. We're going to work with NASA. We're going to work with government. We're going to figure out the stepping stones such that we can achieve our long-term vision. Because it's important to make sure that you are alive in order to build the future. But if you're non-consensus and right, you figure out how to tell a story that brings people along the way, and you end up finding the right stepping stones, these are the companies that can have some of the most impact. And let's take a look at OpenAI, a portfolio company of ours, and probably one of the most impactful companies in the future vision archetype that we've seen over the last decade. They set out in 2015 to build AGI for the benefit of humanity, artificial general intelligence. Now, this is something that had been tried before, and a lot of the response from the market was extreme skepticism. Yeah, right, you can't do that. But they persevered. They set up as a not-for-profit research organization because they felt that gave them the most flexibility to figure out what the right funding model was. Over time, they realized that the transformer architecture that now powers so many of the LLMs that founders in this room are building was going to be the thing that was going to unlock their ability to achieve that they wanted to achieve. And that is a very expensive technology to fund. So they pivoted their business. In 2019, they went from a not-for-profit to a for-profit, so they could access deeper pools of capital, the venture market and others, which then allowed them to achieve the amount of funding they needed to build the product they wanted to go after. Of course, with that money came the expectation of a product. And in 2022, we got that product, ChatGPT. And it had almost instant product market fit. But again, much like the iPhone, I certainly couldn't have said in July 2022, three months before ChatGPT came out, that this was the thing that I needed to make myself more effective in my work. And I'm sure many others in the room would agree. After one year, the end of 2023, ChatGPT was making $1.6 billion in revenue for OpenAI. But ultimately, it remains just one of the stepping stones that they are taking in order to prove their commercial viability to allow them to get to AGI. So here's how all the three archetypes come together. Hopefully you see yourself reflected in one of these paths. Maybe more than one, one. that's totally normal. None of these paths are set in stone, it's all fluid, and none of them is better than the other. The point here is actually to raise awareness about which path you're on and how that changes how you approach your customer and your market. We'll see many companies traverse all three of these paths as they release new products, as they enter new sectors, as they serve new customers. That's totally normal. The number one thing that we've heard that's been so illuminating about this framework is that there's more than one path in the first place. Because conventional wisdom says, build something people want, right? How many times have we heard that? That implies that the customer knows what they want and that they're telling you that they want it. And so that, the, that really leaves the hair on fire path as the only option. And so to see the hard fact path and the future vision path up here, has been a really big aha moment for many of the founders that we work with, and honestly, kind of a relief. So one part about the ARC program is that we don't just walk through frameworks like this. We actually also apply them actively to your company in the moment. And so we created this diagnostic. We challenge you to ask the terrifying question.
For those of you that, that raised your hand for being a hair on fire founder, you're overcoming noise. And that means your product has to be different, like 10x different. Not just the product, but also the marketing. Because it's not enough for your product to be great, your customer has to understand why it is great so they can pick it out of the 70 other competitors. If you are a hard fact founder, you have to overcome habit. And so like we said, your product's got to reach across the table and shake this customer awake and make them believe that this problem can be solved in a different way that's worth their time. And then finally, future vision founders. You've got a long road ahead of you. So you, hopefully you have the conviction in the future that you see, but also like Zephy was talking about, you have an idea of what the stepping stones are to chip away at the disbelief that you'll have to overcome. In addition to these three archetypes to PMF, we believe that we can even further deconstruct the inputs to PMF. And so, but wait, there's more. We're going to walk you through four areas of conviction that you're going to have to build uh, in order to reach product market fit. And so no matter which of the paths you're on, your path will go through building these four areas of conviction. And they are originating belief, problem, solution, and value prop. Awesome. Originating belief. So for all the founders in the room, there's some reason why you started your company. Right? And the terrifying question to ask yourself as you're deciding, do I start this company? Do I go after this idea? Do I go after this competitor? What do I do? Is what is my right to exist as a business? What is your unfair advantage? I think we heard one of the speakers just before us speaking about exactly this. What is your unfair advantage and right to win in the space? If you can answer that question in a compelling way and have the deep belief that this is right for you, then move forward. But know that you are marrying this problem for the decade. And so what does it mean to have conviction at this point? It's saying, yeah, I'm committing myself to this problem, this market, and this opportunity. The next stage is about building conviction in the problem that you are solving. You as a founder might have conviction that this is a good problem, but you've got to get out there. You've got to speak to customers and understand, do people care? Does anyone care about the opportunity that I'm trying to solve for them? And this is true whether you're in the hair on fire, hard fact, or future vision path. You should still be able to speak to customers and understand how they see it. Coming out of these conversations, you want to get to a point where you have a defined ICP, an ideal customer profile, where you can look up on LinkedIn and find 50 people who fit with that, with that background. And then the second piece is around design customers. These are people who are leaning in. They're not just saying, yeah, your demo is cool. Get us back to us when you have the first version of the product. They're saying, I am ready to co-create this product with you, and I'm excited to go on the journey. And that's what it looks like to have conviction at this path. The third area of conviction is conviction in your solution. And this is probably the area that you're spending most of your time and focus on already. The terrifying question here is, does your product actually change customer behavior? This is where the rubber meets the road. So of course, the conviction criteria is retain customers. OK, that's a pretty big jump. How do you get there? When I work with founders during Arc, one thing I suggest is actually getting a whiteboard and put the first and last name of every customer that you're able to get to stick to your product. Understand who, where, who they are, what their job is, where they come from, what problem are they trying to solve in their words, and why is it that they found your product compelling enough to stick to? Then go and get a whiteboard and put it right next to that. And put the first and last name of every customer that didn't stick to your product. Understand where they come from, what job they were trying to do, and why they didn't find your product compelling enough to stick to. In order to do this, you'll probably have to talk to your customer. So we're going to do win interviews. You're going to do loss interviews. And if you imagine these two whiteboards filled with 100 names on each side, you're going to know so much more about what it takes for a customer to stick to your product and what are the similarities between those customers that actually do stick to your product. And so conviction criteria is retain customers. But you also have to be able to scale this. You have to have a line of sight to that. So it's not just enough to have 100 names on a whiteboard. Where do you find the next 100? Where do you find the next 1,000? And is your technology, is your team, are your operations and your processes ready to accept that kind of scale? Finally, we have the fourth area of conviction, value prop. This one was actually controversial. We debated whether to add this or not. Most other frameworks for product market fit say if you have engaged and retained customers, that's the holy grail, right? You've reached product market fit. We would argue no, because you as a founder are probably not just about building a product. You want to build a business, and a business involves value exchange. So it's not enough to put a product in front of a customer and have them use it. They've got to actually write you a check for that product. And it's got to be in the amount that you're looking for. it. And so the conviction criteria here is paying customers at the dollar amount that you expect them to pay. 
In addition to that, we at Sequoia are known for challenging our founders to ask themselves, what is the scale of your ambition? And that's why you see this terrifying number behind me, the path to $100 million in revenue. What is it for you? Is that a lot of customers that pay a little bit, a few customers that pay a lot? What does it look like if your business hits scale and actually reaches its full potential? That's the conviction criteria here. So we have these two different frameworks. The first covers the archetypes, hair on fire, hard fact, and future vision. And the second covers building conviction in the different steps it will take to get to product market fit. At Sequoia, we're in the business of partnering with outlier founders who want to leave a dent in the universe. And those founders show up in a variety of different places in a variety of different businesses. But the consistent thing for each of those companies is they figure out how to find product market fit. Sometimes that journey is quick, like Wiz. Sometimes it takes many years. But the thing that's consistent is we want to be with you on that journey from idea to IPO and beyond. So if you'd like to work deeper with us at Sequoia and Arc, we would be delighted to hear from you. Thank you, and let us help you make that dent in the universe.